Good morning. Good morning and welcome. This is Mr. B's Sunday School. I am Mr. B, also known as Bruce Ehrlich. And today we're here to talk about the glory of God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us. Thank you for your holy word. Pray that you bless now the reading of your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we've got kind of an object lesson today. And you might notice that I went and placed lanterns on the cat's ladder. Uh, and you might say, well, why would you put lanterns on a cat's stairway uh, when cats can see in the dark? Well, to some extent, cats can see in the dark. But can they still get in trouble if it gets too dark? Uh, can they still have uh, stumblings or accidents? Uh, well, my cat does. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but he likes to go in the dark and sometimes I hear him crashing uh, in the back room. So today we're here to talk about, like I said, the glory of God. But what happens when we stray from the glory of God? So we're going to find out a little bit about that today. Um, first of all, though, I have a quote from a guy named Dag. Hammerskold, and he was a Swedish economist, a diplomat. Uh, he served as the second Secretary General of the United Nations from 1953 to 1961, and his quote is, you cannot play with the animal in you without becoming holy animal, nor play with falsehood without forfeiting your right to truth. Play with cruelty without losing your sensitivity of mind. He who wants to keep his garden tidy does not reserve a plot for weeds. Okay, so think about that for a minute. Uh, meanwhile, we've got a, uh, a definition for you uh, from Nelson New Illustrated. Bible Dictionary, and we're just doing a little short part of this definition because it goes on for quite a ways. Um, the definition of today's word is sin. Now, sin, S-I-N, uh, according to Nelson's, is lawlessness or transgression of God's will, either by omitting to do what God's law requires or by doing what it forbids. The transgression can occur in thought, word, or deed. All right, now, uh, as some of you know, I like to uh, help out with the cubbies, three and four and five-year-olds in Awana, and we have a definition. This is the cubbies' definition of sin, and what we say, we like to use uh, hand gestures. Sin is anything you think with your mind, say with your mouth, or do with your hands that makes God sad. All right, that for me, that's easy to understand. A little three-year-old can understand that. Okay, so we got a class note for you. All sin has consequences. That is why... God desires and requires all of his children to avoid sin and to hate sin. Uh, we got an anonymous quote for you this time. It is not enough for a gardener to love flowers. He must also hate weeds. Uh, I've got a question for you. Class question today is... Is our life a beautiful garden, <clears throat> ordered with walkways and benches for God and others to rest in and enjoy? Or 
Is it a weedy briar patch full of poison oak and thistles? Good question. Think about that for a while. Um, got a class note for you. God is not following our lead today any more than he ever has. Many Christians today are very convinced and self-absorbed in what they believe about God. Maybe we have heard the same things about what the Bible supposedly means, and we have our minds made up about how God operates and what God should be doing today or in the near future. May I submit to you that that is a very dangerous way to think because number one, God is in control of all things, not us. And two, God has specifically told us in his word, and we're going to find out what he's told us in his word, by looking at uh, one of my favorite books, the book of Isaiah. And we are in Isaiah chapter 55 and this this passage of scripture has come up before and i'm sure it'll come up again uh we're reading from the the hebrew bible here hebrew 50 uh sorry isaiah 55 8 through 11 says for my thoughts this is god speaking for my thoughts are not your thoughts and your ways are not my ways. The word of the Lord. As high as the heavens over the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For just as the rain and snow descend from heaven and will not return there, Rather, it waters the earth and causes it to produce and sprout and gives seed to the sower and food to the eater. So shall be my word that emanates from my mouth. It will not return to me unfulfilled unless it will have accomplished what I desired and brought success where I sent it. All right, well, we'll see how that works out here in just a minute. Um, before we begin our main reading today, which is going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 4, uh, we will need to back up just a little uh, to get the full flavor of this first verse of 1 Samuel chapter 4. We need to back up a little and review the prophecy concerning the high priest Eli and his household. This is the word of the Lord as revealed to the nation of Israel through Samuel, his servant. All right, so we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 3, and we're going to use the New American Standard Bible for this reading. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 10 through 14 says, Then the Lord came and stood, and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for thy servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity, iniquity is an old word for sin, the iniquity which he knew because his sins brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. 
All right. Okay, so we are in 1 Samuel chapter 4. We're just going to read verse 1. Uh, the word of Samuel befell all of Israel. Israel went out to war against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, while the Philistines encamped at Aphek. Now we notice, and this comes out a little bit different. Uh, uh, I noticed the New International Version and the Revised Standard Version uh, chose to take this first little half sentence here, the word of Sam, or first sentence, the word of Samuel befell all of Israel. They took that and they stuck it back into chapter three. Um, now, why would you do that? Well, um, several reasons, but um, the Hebrew, which is the original language that it was written in, has it in chapter four. And, uh, you know, putting numbers on what was originally a number-free uh, uh, scripture, you know, it's, it's a judgment call. So, so, but uh, the Hebrew chooses to put it here, our King James, uh, all of the other versions that I looked at kept it uh, in verse 1. So why? Why the difference? Well, here we've got a note. The word of Samuel, be, Samuel befell all of Israel. And what, what it's referring to is the fearsome prophecy that we just read in chapter 3. So if you think of it that way, it's kind of an introduction to chapter 4, and it makes sense. Uh, at least to me it does. So I hope that helps um, as we go along. So this is, this is how the prophecy that the Lord gave to Samuel for Israel came about. And this, so enough said about that. Anyway, we're in, uh, we're in King James now. My giant print, my new favorite Bible easy to read. First um, Samuel chapter 4 verses 2 and 3. Let me get it in the light here. So some of these passages, you know, um, typically what happens is I get an assignment. I'll get uh, a three chapter section uh, typically and then uh, I can teach on anything in that, in that group. Well, last time this year this last year, a year ago, when we got this group, I chose to teach out of a, a different chapter. Uh, but this time, we, we wanted to look at chapter 4. Last time, we kind of a, avoided chapter 4 because it's a little bit dark. Um, and you wonder why some of my sets are a little bit dark. Well, some of the stuff we talk about here is, uh, to the casual viewer, maybe not very exciting. But you have to, to think about it as... Uh, what is the what is the Lord trying to say here? Sure, it's a dark story. Sure, it's uh, it's uh, you know maybe something that we in our own nature we want to try to avoid. We don't like it. It's not comfortable. Well, why does God have it in there? Why did God put that in the Bible? Uh, is the world a dark place? Yeah. Do we put up little lanterns on the cat stairway? Sure. Uh, we do what we can to brighten up the world, and I think. What I hope what we're going to see today is that there's a lot of light. There's a bright spotlight in the middle of this story that we can bring hope into our lives from. And we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll see that here in just a second. So hang in there. Uh, and the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And the, when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies." All right, so um, sometimes I like to look at a version of the Bible called the Amplified Bible. Um, 
And we'll see that a couple times today. Uh, first of all, I have a little, just one verse from Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 3 says, Amplified Bible, The foolishness of man undermines his way, ruining whatever he undertakes. Then his heart is resentful and rages against the Lord. For being a fool, he blames the Lord instead of himself. All right. I, I love the way that goes. Uh, it's true. Of course. <laughs> All right. First Samuel 4, 4 through 6 says, So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts which dwelleth between the cherubims, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come into the camp. All right. So if you don't already have something to drink, you might want to run and get something to drink. If you need a snack, take care of that. Uh, we got a lot of excitement. Uh, it all starts happening right now. For 340 years... The tabernacle had been at Shiloh for 340 years. The tribe of Ephraim had been blessed by the presence of the ark at Shiloh. However, we're going to see that the ark now departs from Shiloh, never to return. I looked this up in Wikipedia, so it must be true. Uh, according to Wikipedia, you can still visit Shiloh today. Uh, it says public access, yes. Condition, ruins. So there you have it. Um, got a reading from 1 Samuel 4, 7 through 11. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us! Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men, and fight! And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter. For there fell of Israel thirty thousand footmen, and the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. Okay, um, the nation of Israel, for their presumptuous uh, presumption and lack of repentance, should have been exiled. But instead, God allows himself, his ark, to be exiled. And in his exile does much damage to the nation of the Philistines. Um, and we, we did a lesson on... on the ark in the presence of the Philistines last year. From Deuteronomy 12, 5 through 11, and you can go back and look that up if you want to, we know that wherever the ark of the covenant is set up, there the people of Israel are to come to worship and to sacrifice. All right, we got a reading from 1 Samuel 4, 12 through 18. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching. 
for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of the God, the ark of God is taken. All right. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck brake and he died. For he was an old man and heavy and he had judged Israel 40 years. All right. Now, and you might notice that word heavy. Well, the word heavy in Hebrew is kavod. In the Old Testament, the glory of the Lord, or praise be to the Lord, um, that's, that's what it meant. So it was a way of witnessing the Lord's beauty and radiance. Kabod re was repeated about 34 times in the Old Testament. Kabod has also been mentioned in this last verse we just read. Uh, as being related to something heavy. We have that word still today. We say heavy. Uh, well, we used to. Maybe we don't anymore. Uh, but heavy can be used both physically and figuratively. Here we find Eli, the high priest, referred to as kabod, or heavy. While later we find Eli's daughter-in-law uh, naming Eli's grandson Ichabod which is used to express regret for the glory of God, which has departed. Quite literally, it means, where is the glory? And Eli's daughter-in-law laments or, or is sad at the glory being gone from Israel because the ark is gone. All right, so we got our last reading from 1 Samuel here. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with child near to be delivered and when she heard the tidings that the ark of god was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead she bowed herself and travailed for her pains came upon her and about the time of her death the woman that stood by her said unto her fear not for thou hast borne a son but she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because her father-in-law and her husband <coughs> the ark of God was taken, and because her father-in-law and because of her, oh, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. All right, so that's important. They repeated that there. So, what we have now is, da -da -da -da, class roundup. We haven't done that in a while, so it's good to do that once in a while. Now, the lack of money is a terrible thing. Some of us have experienced that. Uh, the inability to pay our bills or to retain our property can cause us fear and anxiety. Then there is the lack of food, which can cause us suffering, pain, and eventually sickness and even death. But there is a lacking 
that is far more devastating and far more destructive to our joy and our eternal well-being than the loss of money or the loss of food. And that is the loss of God's glory. When we drift away from God's presence by failing to keep up with our personal devotions or by allowing ourselves to become distracted by the things of this world, we lose something much more precious, much more important, much more dear to the survival and health of our soul and our spirit. We can lose our foundation. We can lose our peace. We can lose our center of gravity so to speak, and we can find that our values and our motivation for living is suddenly clouded, obscured, or even lost completely. The glory and the presence of God, our personal relationship with God, through the person of God the Son, by God the Spirit, may be something we are easily distracted from by world events, family troubles, television, or cell phone addiction, or any one of a number of things that the busy, chaotic, and dying, and dark world around us uh, can cause. But there is only one thing that can restore our soul, build our confidence, and give eternal strength and joy to our spirit and that is the presence of the glory of God the amplified Bible version of Hebrews 12 1 and 2 says therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us. And let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us looking away from all that will distract us and focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of faith, the first incentive for our belief and the one who brings our faith to maturity, who for the joy of accomplishing the goal set before him endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, and the completion of his work. To all of this I say, Amen and Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. Thank you for your glory, which we can participate in by having a personal relationship with you through the reading of your word, through meditation and prayer. Pray that you would be with us this week. Help us to renew our interest in your word, renew our interest in prayer. Bless us with the ability to remember your word and to think about it. Every day we pray. Be with us this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, have a good week. And don't, take a, don't forget to take a lantern with you. It's dark out there.